in today's show. We look at the 10 games from Wednesday across the NBA, some injury news, unfortunately, and Michael Bolton. Thanks, Josh. It's Michael Bolton here, and it's time for another episode of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Let's get to it. Let's get to it, indeed. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at basketballmonster.com. And you can find me on Twitter as always at redrock underscore Beeble, on TikTok at redrock underscore Beeble, and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. Thank you for making Locked On Fantasy Basketball your first listen every day. We are free and we are available on all platforms. There are 10 games that we're going to talk about today. So, Warnie. Let's get it on, Gilly. <laughs> All right, some news out of LA. Tom Bryant and Dennis Schroeder are probable and likely to return on Friday. So I'll get the questions out of the way that people are asking. Hey, are these guys that we add? Do we add Tom Bryant? Ooh, no, Anthony Davis hates playing center, so he's Thomas Bryant and add. I'd be really, really doubtful that they come in and say, All right, Bryant, you're playing 25 minutes a night at center, which he would need to do to be useful for most leagues um, when it's pretty clear that Davis is best at center and that's what he's played basically exclusively all season. It's not that you know, guys like Troy Brown can't be excised from the rotation or from the starting lineup to put Brian in there, but they've had Damian Jones sitting there all season and they haven't decided to go with that move. They might, but I wouldn't take, I don't think Brian's upside is high enough to stash for the possibility that, the, that maybe he gets to 25 minutes. Schroeder is a little bit different. He is probably going to play more minutes and play a sizable role, and I expect that he does take over the starting position from Patrick Beverly. The last time Schroeder was 12-team relevant was with the Lakers, the year after their championship season. He was the 101st-ranked player in that year. He played 32 minutes a night. Davis played 35 games. LeBron played 42, and Westbrook wasn't there. So he was able to do the things that he needs to do to be useful in fantasy. Have the ball control an offense, and get usage. And despite some of our feelings about Westbrook, he is playing well off the bench. So Westbrook, LeBron, and Davis are still are there. They're going to be prioritized usage-wise, and Westbrook and LeBron are going to be prioritized assist-wise. So you're going to get a lot of off-ball Schroeder, I would expect. And like the guy's fantasy game is not that strong. Now, he did have a really good season in OKC like four years ago, and that was playing with other point guards like Chris Paul. I'm just I'm just not sure he maintains high enough usage or high enough assist rate to be this great must-roster 12-team league guy. If I'm taking a flyer on anyone, it's Schroeder over Bryant, but I wouldn't just say, well, look what he did last time in LA next to LeBron, because it was half a season of LeBron and half a season of Davis, and you've got the added the added issue of Westbrook. And I don't think the Beverly gets taken completely out of the rotation. And you've got Lonnie Walker taking a lot of shots as well. It is a little bit of a confusing situation. I don't mind him as an ad, but he's not like, oh, this is an absolute must brain. I've got to go grab him. I think he'll be fine as like a real sort of back-end player. The next bit of news is it looks like Kyrie Irving is going to return on Sunday from his suspension. So... Here, the value of Sumner is going to die. Seth Curry, Joe Harris, they're going to lose value. We don't know what's going to happen with Ben Simmons in that time. Um, So Kyrie could be back. It looks like he'll be back on Sunday. Kyra Lewis is back. He's playing G League tomorrow. So his ACL recovery is done in terms of no on-court competitive games. Uh, There's no actual minutes in the uh, Pelicans rotation, but he is back. And then Kawhi is still out tomorrow. Oh, God, I don't know when he's coming back. I hoped at some point we'd get it this week, but we're not there yet. Maybe later in the week. I, I don't know. All I know is that he's currently still out, and he is currently still doing my absolute head in because I just don't know what's happening in this situation. Let's. Uh, we're not going to do most added waiver players. We did a waiver wire show earlier today. So let's just look at the first game of the day. The Indiana Pacers, they beat... The Charlotte Hornets, because they're a little bit feisty at the moment, the Pacers. Some good numbers here, 125-113. Tyrus Halliburton was questionable heading in with an ankle issue. 
He had 22, 2, and 11 with three steals on 60% shooting and is the 10th ranked player this season. Basically, bang on where you drafted him. He's been great. Miles Turner, also great. 20 and 10, three blocks, 70% shooting. He is the 14th ranked player and a top 30 fantasy points player. That's amazing. I don't think there's going to be a significant drop-off, maybe for points leagues, if he does get traded. Just enjoy what's happening. Budrick Heald, only 31 minutes, but 19, 2 and 4, two steals and a block is a really strong game. Benedict Mather, an old Humpty Dumpty himself. <clears throat> He's an interesting one, isn't he? He's playing with gigantic usage, and people love it. Love his scoring, love it. 20 points in 22 minutes is great. Like, there's no doubt about that. They are really, really good numbers, right? Um, but there's nothing else. Three rebounds, zero assists, zero steals, zero blocks. He was a minus 13, the, by far the worst on the team. And that's why he only played 22 minutes. He still is a 12-team must-roster player, but he's only a back-end sort of guy because of some of those lacking areas. And that usage is just so big. What do we do with sticks? Stand by your man! Once again... He looks useless. Like, he's bad out on the court. Um, 11 and 7, 26 minutes, a block, 36% shooting. Like, 11 and 7 with a block on its surface isn't dreadful. It's the fact that he was 36 from the field and 75 from the line, with hurt, which hurts. And despite all that he has sucked this season, and he sucked really hard, he's only the 182nd ranked player. Um, but think about it this way. If you drop Jalen Smith, is there anyone rushing to grab him? And the answer is probably no. There's no one rushing to grab his minutes on the paces, but maybe he's just actually bad. Yes, he is actually bad. Um, we've given it a little bit of time. We're four weeks in. He's been bad. The minutes have been up and down. I'm not sure that it's worth it. Isaiah Jackson remains a hold. He had the three blocks here. We're just holding and waiting. It's a luxury stash though, for sure. While Andrew Nembhard is playing 22 minutes because of some reason, I don't know, 13 points for him. Three steals. He's only like a 14-team league guy, I think. And we also got 21 O'Shea Brissett minutes. I honestly don't care for O'Shea Brissett in any sort of um, 12 or 14-team league format. <clears throat> for the Hornets, let's start with the bad news. LaMelo Ball sprained his ankle, stood on a fan's foot in the last two minutes of the game. Steve Clifford said things which don't actually mean anything, but it sounds good. He said he's hopeful it's okay. But we'll find out more tomorrow. Like, we're all hopeful it's okay, Steve. But you've got more information than us. So how about you let us in on it? I don't know how bad it is. It was the same ankle that he sprained already. And he was back. 37 minutes, 26 points, 5 triple, 6 assists, and 2 steals. It's a bloody good line. But we now we just don't know. Now, is it worth a grab of Dennis Smith Jr.? Maybe. We don't know whether Smith's going to play. Is it worth a grab of the Salt Flake Theo Maladon? I don't think so. I think if you added Maladon, you might get one game and then Smith comes back after that. And then by then, Ball might return anyway. It's a little bit of an up and down. It's not of a, as straightforward of an ad as, say, a campaign is with Chris Paul out, especially with Clifford's comments, whatever, the, however you want to make those out, um, to say that he's hopeful. I would add Smith over Maladon. Understand that Smith may not even play next game. Kelly Oubre continues to take too many shots, 21 of them here, 38% shooting, 17 and 13 with two steals. He's getting some okay numbers. I honestly don't see it lasting all season, but those numbers are okay. While Paul Washington Jr., he's never going to be a high field goal guy, but 24, 4, and 4 with four triples, that gives you a little bit of, uh, of extra value. And the cockroach, Mason Plumley, 12 and 10, 29 minutes, two blocks. Steve Clifford really enjoying what he's doing, loving the work that he's doing at the moment, and that means we have to look at him. He has to be a 12-team league player. Jalen McDaniels, yeah, pretty gross. Three points, four rebounds, four assists, two steals, a block. Actually, that's not true gross. Like Four rebounds, four assists, two steals, and a block is good. It's the fact that he was horrendous from the field, horrendous from the line, and played 20 minutes. He would stand to get extra playing time if Ball was out because Rogier would shift across and play more point guard, and that would open up more wing minutes and Haywood's out. But long term, I don't really see Jalen McDaniels as a 12-team league player. Obviously, we can drop Big Dick Nick Richards, who had five points in 19 minutes. As for Maladon, he had seven and three with two steals again. I don't think that's a high priority at in 12 team formats. Um, yeah, today's episode is brought to you by Better Help. There's a lot that's going on in the world. Wherever you are, there's always something going on macro, micro level, and it impacts us. And sometimes unlocking those things that go on in our brain is a real key to surviving and coping and thriving. 
So therapists, they are trained to help you figure out what is causing the challenging emotions and helps you learn productive coping skills, which makes therapy the closest thing to a guided tour of the complex engine that is called you. BetterHelp has connected over 3 million people with licensed therapists. It's convenient and accessible anywhere, 100% online. As the world's largest therapy service, BetterHelp has matched 3 million people with professionally licensed and vetted therapists available 100% online. Plus, it's affordable. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to match with a therapist. And if things aren't clicking, you can easily switch to a new therapist anytime. It couldn't be simpler. No waiting rooms, no traffic, no endless searching for the right therapist. Learn more and save 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash locked on MBA. That's betterhelp, H E L P.com slash locked on NBA. The second game was a uh, pretty big win for the Wolves 126 128 over your. Orlando Magic. Um, let's talk about the Wolves. Let's talk about the good that's also mixed in with some bad. I want to couch all of these things on the Wolves by saying, go and have a look at who was playing for the Magic. But Anthony Edwards had 35, 8, and 6. He had six tri- seven triples. He had two steals and a block. But of course, he was still brutally bad from the free throw line. I have no idea what's going on. I feel like he is the guy this year. It was CJ last season. It was Anthony Davis in the past. It was Russell Westbrook in the past. It was Paul Gasol before him. Good free throw shooters who become bad. He wasn't an excellent free throw shooter. He was an above average one or barely above average. But now he's just bad. And maybe we have to reassess that he's just a punt free throw guy. Hopefully there's room for improvement. But that was bad. Everything else is good. Towns also had a big game, 30 and 5, 5 assists and a steal. It helps when your center opposition is Mo Bamba and Bol Bol, guys who really struggled to contain anything defensively. And Gobert had 16 and 8, 2 steals and a block. We th- talked about D'Angelo Russell last game. He was great. And would he be able to keep that going? Um, no. 11, 3 and 6, a triple one, 42%. But to be fair to Russell, he was looking much worse earlier on in this game and put together some good numbers late. While Jaden McDaniels, Probably the most illustrative game that I've seen from him about what he does. Like 10 and 8, a triple one, bad shooting, 50% from the line. And it's just like, ugh, it's not bad enough to drop. It's not good enough to get excited about. It's just they're doing things. Like it's fine to hold, but there is no real upside, I don't think. Kyle Anderson, 20 minutes. Love the defense, three steals and two blocks. 20 minutes, but it's just a 14-team league stream guy, I think. Well, the Jalen Noel uh, train has stopped. It is ground to a halt. Seven minutes, missed all five of his shots. He went scoreless. He was bad. And he's been bad for a while. He had a little stretch where he was good, and he's bad again. For the Magic, as I said, look who was out. Wendell Carter Jr., Paolo Banquero, Cole Anthony, Marco Fultz, Gary Harris, Voldemort. All those guys are out. There's a That's five to six. It's... I mean, Jesus Christ, why can't I count it? Six rotation players that are probably out of that team, and maybe you don't count Voldemort, or maybe you don't count Harris. I get that. But that is a lot. So they played a lot of bad players. But it also meant the guys who were there who were decently talented put up good numbers, like Bol Bol. 35 minutes, 26 and 12, one steal and three blocks. That is undoubtedly a really, really good game. That still doesn't bring him inside the top 100 for points leagues on the season. And when I talked about him on the Waiver Wire show earlier today, I was talking about long-term points league value. He's a significantly better category league value player than points league. And when guys come back, I just don't see Bol playing a 35-minute-a-night role. I think he's a 24 to 25-minute-a-night player at best. But he took advantage of the opportunities, and he was actually really good. But how many times do we expect Bol Bol to lead the team in usage, even though he was a minus 22? I was really encouraged by Jalen Suggs. Still rough from the line, 67%. 23, 6, and 6, 5 triples, 2 steals. Hurt his ankle again, but was able to return. I thought he showed quite a bit here. I like him for 12s. Franz Wagner had 18, 6, and, um, and 4. Well, Bamba, I'm just okay, he's just not a very good player. And yes, while Carter and um, uh, Bunkero are, are out, there are minutes for him. He's one of the absolutely stereotypical shit in real life, good in fantasy players. And when the minutes are there, he produces good things. So I would hold him until we hear that these guys are back. But when they're back, no chance. Oh, but what if he carves out 20 minutes? I don't see how there's any way when there is 10 better players on this roster than him. Easily. Trimmer KK. He's a steals guy. That's it. Five points on eight shots is dreadful. Terrence Ross is never going to do anything. And then uh, RJ Hampton's pretty much a lost cause, I would say. He's not very good. He's uh, yeah, a lost cause would be my uh, description of RJ Hampton. Third game. 
it's your Oklahoma City Thunder beating the Wizards 121-120. Shea Gildas Alexander did it again. Game winning three. 42, six and seven with a block. This is your number one ranked player in category leagues, your number four ranked player in points leagues. Would I sell him high? I don't think so. Okay, he could get hurt at any point. I know that, but he's not hurt and he's rolling and no one's giving you a top 10 player and it's just fun and the Thunder might be good. I don't know if they are, but they might be good. Let's now talk about the frustrating part about the Thunder and the frustrating narratives that get attached to stuff that they do. Alexei Pokyshevsky played 14 minutes, started the game, had eight points, two threes, and three blocks. Two threes and three blocks in 14 minutes is excellent, and we are 100% still holding him. But he was benched to start the second half, and he just I don't even think he played again in the second half. Or if he did, it was very minor. Um, but the things, oh man, look, what a blatant tanking move. This is literally the opposite of tanking because when Poku was out there, they were getting roasted. They were getting destroyed. Porzingis was just eating him apart, right? Just ripping him to shreds. So Dagnall went, mm, no, if we're actually going to win this game, Poku can't be out there. So they made the change. They made the comeback and they got the win. Literally the opposite of tanking. Because if you're tanking, what you say, we don't care about the results. We're not going to make moves to win. We're going to try to develop these players. And they didn't do that at all. So benching Poku is not tanking. Benching Josh Giddy, who was also really quite poor in this game, was not tanking. It was them saying, ooh, we are going to win this game by playing the lineups that are making the sense against our opponent. And that's what Dagnot did. He replaced um, Poku with Robinson L. Not that he did a lot. He replaced Giddy with Lindy Waters, who nailed nine points for three triples and two steals. And he is an excellent shooter. Struggles in some other areas. I wouldn't react to that. But... This is going to be a frustration with the Thunder all year. I tell you who is... And don't, hey, by the way, don't drop Giddy or don't drop Poku. This guy is coming up a little bit. Broncos country, let's ride. Yeah, the Bronco, Jalen Williams, off the bench, but 28 minutes, 10, 4, and 6. I just thought he looked good out there. Making smart passes, defending well. He's big. He's got good size. I don't think we're going to get a consistent 30-minute-a-night role, but we are getting at least consistent 25-plus at the moment. I don't think that he's a must-roster 12-team league guy. He's a speculative 12-team league added in category leagues, not in points leagues, just to see where it goes. But I I highly doubt that it's going to go where we want it to go fast enough. But he's looking much better. Lou Dort, 16 points, but yeah, I just... He did play well to to end the game. Great play on Bradley Beal on his attempted game winner at the end. He played... He did well at the end. I just just don't love him as a player. He's not a great category league guy. He's just a back-end player, I think, with limited upside. Well, Giddy had 11-6-2 and and only played the 20 minutes. Kenrich Williams got the extra minutes with Robinson Earl ineffective and Poku gets... uh, Poku struggling, that's what I'm trying to say. 9-5 with a triple one for Kenrich. For the Wizards, Kristaps Porzingis. Porzingis. 27-9, four triples, steal and a block. Excellent. He is the 25th ranked player this season. Really, really good. We hope that he stays healthy. Kuzma, 18, 10, and 9. Almost a triple-double for the big fella. Well, Bradley Beal returned and had 25, 6, and 6 a steal on a block with two threes. Really good from all those guys. The rest of the team, rough. Jordan Goodwin closed the game over Monty Morris until he hurt his knee. Denny Avdia sort of fell into his knee, pushed it back a little bit. It didn't look very good. He was down on the court for a long time. I don't know what the status of Goodwin is. Now, what I do know is that 4-3-1 and one with a block is not good enough to keep holding in 12 or 14 team leagues, especially with a knee injury cloud over him. So we can go ahead and move on. Monte Morris had 11, 3-4. and four. He had two steals. He also hit three triples and was out of the game so Jordan Goodwin could close over him. I don't think there's any point holding on to Monte in 12 team leagues. Can he be a top 140 guy? Sure. Can he get higher than top 130? I don't even think so. Rui Hachimura. I'll just keep doing this because I keep seeing him rostered in 12-team leagues. Get that garbage out of here! Like, what are we doing? Why is he being held? 14 points is okay. Three steals is okay. But this is a guy that's not top 200 in category leagues. He's not top 180 in points leagues. Why? Why is he rostered? Avdia? Hmm. 40% shooting only, but 30 minutes for Denny again. 12-7, and seven, two threes, two blocks. Top 70 over the last week. That is very interesting. I don't think he's an ad, but I also don't think it's bad to grab him. I don't think it's bad. That's really, really interesting. This guy's shit house. No, f- you, Will. No, he's round his sack back. F- you, Ron Will. Give it off quick. Five points for Barton, while Corey Kispert went from starting to playing 11 minutes, and Dan Gafford played six minutes. Also, um, starting legend Anthony Gill 
Played zero minutes. Remember when they started him? Remember that good decision from you, Wes Unsold? Shout out to KZ Okpala. We'll go to the next game in a second. Well, actually, we won't go there now because I've got to tell you guys about Sweatblock. Today's episode is brought to you by Sweatblock. I'm going to tell you the story of Christopher, Texas legend Christopher, who went to school in the summer. Why not? And he did it wearing a sweater because he was embarrassed about sweat stains. Now, Christopher, your number one solution there is don't go to school in the summer. But your second one is get sweat block because that's going to stop all that excessive sweating. It's going to stop stains and odors on your T-shirt because it's doctor created and it's got a guarantee. If you use sweat block and you still sweat and your shirt's not kept dry, they give you your money back and they creatively call it the dry shirt guarantee. If sweat block doesn't keep you dry, you get your money back. So if you or someone you love, if you've got a Christopher in your life, you can try Sweatblock risk-free today. You can save 20% as well by using the promo code locked on at sweatblock.com or you can pay full price at Amazon. But Sweatblock is here to help you stop that sweating. Hmm, next game. Wow, slow pace today. The Heat and the Raptors. Really um, good win for the Raptors, 112-104. They were down big and had a huge run, I think in the third quarter it was. They were without some big players, maybe. Bam Adebayo, Tyler Hero. Victor Oladipo, who is very rapidly becoming TJ Warren territory. Is he ever going to play this bloke? It's a long way away, apparently. Oh, Jesus. Okay. So what that means is that it stabilizes the Winter Soldier, Max Struess's value. Now, Struess had a little hot patch. I think it was the second quarter where he had like 14 quick points. 20 points. He ended up with three threes, two steal, and a block. Now, he doesn't do much usually outside of the scoring and the threes. And he is, of course, really boosted top 75 over the last week because Hero has been out. And then, of course, also helped by the fact that Bam was out. So roll with him, try and sell high for a top 100 guy, and then I think you'll see the drop-off come later. It's also two big games in a row for Caleb Martin. 14 and 9, two threes and two blocks. But you know what? Bam Adebayo was out, so I don't actually care about Caleb. He is an elite streamer for lower volume days. He's totally okay if your league goes slightly deeper. 14 teams, 12 teams with 14-man rosters, no worries. But the upside is just not there. It's been proven over and over again. Gabriel Vincent played 32 minutes, 16, 2, and 5. I like him in 14 team leagues. And it was a rough night from Jimmy Butler. 13, 1, and 5. Not that he shot poorly, he just never got the shots off. Maybe because there's a bloke on the other side who's one of, if not the, well, actually, he is. He's the best defender in basketball who was uh, doing some lockdown stuff on him. While Lowry had 19, 1, and 2 with four triples. Little Chunga started for Bam. He started off red hot as well. He had four of five uh, in the first course. He had like eight or nine points early on. And then ended with 13, 3, and 1. So I really, and this is not, because I don't know who, who wrote this or anything like that. And it's not to call that whoever did it, because I know those those guys over at Roto World, NBC Sports Edge. But be really careful sometimes about the headlines you read. It's like Nikola Jovic has really good game in start. And like, I guess, but 13, 3, and 1, uh, after he went like red hot and dropped in like nine points in three minutes to start the game and then was invisible for the rest of the game. I wouldn't be that excited about it. And Bam was out. So I'm not doing anything here at all. Now, I'm not saying that look, Bam might miss the next game. He's got a lit knee contusion. I don't think he will. But I'm not overreacting to this game from Jovic. I do think there is a chance he can become their starting power forward at some point. But that some point is probably next season. Um, not much else going on there. But for the Raptors, they were without Siakam. They were without Trent. They were out without Achua. They were out without Otto Porter. And then they lost Delano Banton. Go ahead and drop Delano Banton if you did add him. Not that... Um, you know, some, uh, some of you did. Get that garbage out of here! He played 21 minutes, which is four fewer minutes than last game. He had five points on 20% shooting with a steal, or with a rebound and assist and a steal. We talked about how outlier that game was and how it had no chance of sticking. And then he proved it. But he also went down with what looked like a pretty serious ankle injury. Nurse said it was pretty serious, so we're expecting he's missing time, so he's an ob obvious drop. Fred Van Vliet returned. He said he was still feeling pretty sick, but ended up with 23-1-8. Really rough shooting night. Started off horribly, but ended up with some good good numbers there. While Thad Young remains a really solid stream while Achura and Siakam are out. 12-8 and eight in 28 minutes. Scotland Barnes, good. Really good. He'd been bad, we know this, but this was step forward. 19-6-6, six six, a triple one. More aggressive, still not up to 20% usage, which we'd like him to get to, but 64% shooting. Do I look at the 64% and think that's more realistic, or is it the 19 usage with those guys out that worries me a little bit? I'm still a bit worried. I'm still a bit worried, but this was undoubtedly a good game from Bardsey. Well, the Jedi. OG, Ananobi. 
But what about Scar? OG. Balenciaga stop ones. OG. Uh, you better stop OG. I'm gonna do the old one as well. Hello there. 32 and 10, 1 3 and a block, 72% shooting, 83 from the line. This is a top 25 fantasy player this season. Is he a sell high? Maybe, but I don't think so. Like, I'd rather just roll it out. Like, he's he's really good. And there's going to be some drop-off in some of his efficiency stuff, but but he's really good. And maybe he's their second best player. I don't know. I don't know. It doesn't actually matter. But he's killing it, and I would just enjoy it. Like, that's where we're at with him. He's dominating. Boucher had 15 and 10. While Siakam and Achua and Trent are out, you roll with him. When everyone's healthy, you drop him. I think that's a pretty common pattern. We also got 23 unnecessary minutes from Juancho Hernan Gomez, who went scoreless. Uh, yep, I mean, oh, he's getting NBA minutes for some reason. And I don't know what that reason is. Let's go to the next game because there's not a lot more to talk about in that one. We've got the Boston Celtics blowing out the Atlanta Hawks despite Marcus Smart and Malcolm Brogdon being out. So we can look at this game and we can just toss out most of it. Luke Cornett had 15 and 8 with four blocks. Like, sick. Great. 25 minutes, not happening. Um, maximum Derek White, 16, 5, and 10. Great. Sick. It required two starting guards to be out. White had sort of stepped it up a little bit with Brogdon out, but the long-term value for White, roll with him now. No problem. Add him, stream him, use him, make sense with these guys out, and then he's going to be a drop later on. Peyton Pritchard played 24 minutes, so there you go. 14 points, 3 and 4, 4 triples, 63% shooting, couldn't care less. Grant Williams had 18 points, continues to be efficient, didn't do anything else. He's a fringe 12-team league guy. While Jalen Brown... JB, you've done it again. Had 22 points with five rebounds. And Jason Tatum had 19, 7, 8. We talked about Tatum, or I talked about it somewhere. Talking about how, hey, I don't reckon he's going to stick at these high block numbers or at this high two-point percentage. The blocks have actually stuck. The two-point percentage or the shooting numbers in general have fallen the last two games. He really struggled here. And that's going to drop him down the rankings because that what was what was pushing him to a top four player is like insane shooting numbers for him and high block numbers. And we'll see if that's able to stick. For the Hawks, Trey Young, he was on the buy low the other day, talked about how bad his um, percentages were. He was able to step it up a little bit. And look, 44% from him is a win. He still only hit 29% from three, but 27, five and nine with a steal. I saw a post somewhere about, I think it was on Reddit and someone was saying, well, the reason Trey Young's numbers are down is because now he he's too much of a chucker and now he had to give up all his shots and assists to DeJounte Murray, which is just blatantly false. His usage is up. His assist rate is the same. Like nothing's changed. The shots just aren't going in. So be careful what narratives you believe without actually checking the numbers. Hey, if I tell you something, check it as well. Because maybe I'm making something up or misread something or got confused. That is possible. But always double check it. DeJounte Murray, almost the identical game, game to last time when I said, mm, I think this might be sort of what he does. 19, 3, and 5. And that's going to bring him back. Again, he's already started to drop. He's the 18th ranked player now, 16th in points leagues. And we were drafting him like in the early 20s. He's starting to push back to that zone. Better game from the Baptist. 12 points with three blocks for John Collins, but still... Only three rebounds and nothing else. Pretty empty stuff. He is going to improve, I think, from where he was. And you want to talk about, guys, the Hawks version of Rui Hachimura. Get that garbage out of here! John Ray Hunter. Who's rostering him? What are you guys doing? Are you feeling all right? Like, what are, you, what are you seeing here? 13 and 4 with, you're going to be shocked. Hold on to your dicks or your friend's dicks or whoever's dick you can hold on to. Just find one, hold on to it. You're going to be shocked because you'll fall over. He had zero steals and zero blocks. Also failed to get an assist and was poor shooting the ball. Wow, what a, what a stunner. And he only had four rebounds. Like this is who DeAndre Hunter is. I don't know why we're surprised. I don't know why we're expecting more. His roster percentage went up. It should be going down by 40%. This is the 164th ranked player in points leagues, averaging 21 fantasy points. How six that? What a great number. He is 210th in categories. What an awesome player. Stop rostering him. Stop it. I beg you to do one thing, and that's piss this bloke off. We saw AJ Griffin get a good rotation role again. This is important for deep leagues. He's not doing much with it. Six points in 21 minutes, but getting those minutes is key. Well, it was a bad clinker Palanite, just seven and eight in 18 minutes, but a Kongwu couldn't really take advantage. Two and nine, his 21. It was a blowout, so we're throwing a lot of the stuff out from that game, but not all of it. Not all of it needs to be... Um, uh, jacked. Let us move on to the next game. This was, speaking of blowouts, the Chicago Land Bulls. They lose to the Pelicans. It was only 124, 110 in the end, but this game was over really, really early. Um, DeRozan had 28, 4, and 7 in 31 minutes. Shot the ball extraordinarily well, 73 from the field. 
the vein continues to plot along at sub sub i was gonna say subpar but it's not it's subprime like he's sub he's prime below his prime below his um peak output 25 3 and 5 41 percent maybe the knee's just rooted huh um vooch 14 and 10 like okay but not great still low efficiency like that's like just not great um i'm ready to call it i called it early in the season and then he made me look stupid but let's go again Aya Get that garbage out of here! Like, he's just not that good. He was getting by on insane efficiency. He's low usage. He had four, three, and one. Like, see you later. And if Lonzo Ball ever returns, he'll lose everything. And Goran Dragic should just start playing him every night. He's just not that good. Patrick Williams also isn't that good. And he left this game with an ankle injury. I think he's probably worth holding more than Desumu. There's only one more game left for the Bulls this week. And if you want to drop Patrick Williams, no one's going to rush to grab him. Like, no one cares that much. His upside's not that high. Dragic had another six points with seven assists. And Javante Green was pretty bad. Three points in 15 minutes. This team's going nowhere. Pretty poor front office decisions a lot of the time. Drafting Pat Williams. Trading for Vucevic. I thought even getting DeRozan like, didn't really make sense in terms of the timeline of where the team was. And I don't know really what they do from here. Pretty bad. For the Pelicans, the big fella, Ken Murphy the third, 19 and 10 in 25 minutes with five threes, three steals, and one block. Now, the 79% shooting is not real, but maybe it is. He might be a top five shooter in the NBA. He's a- actually that good. He's unbelievable in that, um, in that role. Unbelievable. And I will argue... I will argue that he is a better player than Herb Jones or at least a significantly better fit in that starting lineup. Having a starting lineup with Zion Williamson, Jonas Valanciunas, and Herb Jones, it's too many non-shooters. Yes, Jones is an elite defender, but you know who's also a really good defender? Trey Murphy. To me, he makes complete sense as a a 30-minute-a-night starter on this team next to Ingram, next to Zion. I don't know if Willie Green gets there, but he's worth grabbing just to see if we get that switch over. Now, Jones did very little. 10 points, two threes, a steal. Uh, to me, he's a steal streamer. That's it. He's not a must roster player. And in points leagues, you can jack him off double fisted. Get that garbage out of here! Two good scoring games in a row for CJ McCollum 23, 4, and 8, 50% shooting. And remember yesterday when Zion was out, I said, hey, let's watch to see. Because someone said, does this mean better things for Larry Nance? And I said, I don't think so. I think it might actually be worse for Nance. And then Valanciunas got into his weird foul trouble and Stephen Adams got into foul trouble, so they went small, so Nance played more. But what we saw today was exactly what I thought was possibly going to happen. No Zion, so they need more JV. The problem is not necessarily JV on his own, Jonas Valanciunas. It's the Zion-Valanciunas pairing. And when Zion's out, 27 minutes for Valanciunas, 22 and 7, two triples, one block, Great numbers. If you can trade him for a top 60 player, you absolutely do it immediately. You can, hey, he's back on track, but he doesn't really fit my build. Get rid of him. This is a Zion absence game. And Larry Nance played 19 minutes, had eight, six, and three. And I would hold Larry Nance. But this is the thing that is really important. It's not as straightforward as Larry Nance is labeled as a power forward center on my fantasy team. So Zion's out, so Nance will play that role. Or he's just been playing over Valanciunas every game. So he will just continue to do it. The reason that he plays those minutes is because he fits with Zion. And he's a perfect defensive um, guy to sit next to Zion. And this is what I thought would happen yesterday. It didn't happen yesterday for those reasons I laid out. But this is what happened here. So if Zion continues to miss, don't be surprised if you get a run of low games from Larry and a run of big games from Jonas. That is not a surprise. This is actually perfectly in line with what I expected. And it played out that well. And it's always good when something plays out the way you expect it. Jonas Vasu Inuansas. Ingram had 16, 6, and 9, and McCollum had another good shooting night, 23, 4, and 8. This team's actually really good. And um, it's another solid game from Alvarado as well, 13 points, but he's more of a like 14 to 16 team league player. The next game, the Cleveland Cavaliers, they had a really hot start to the season. Um, probably, probably not so hot at the moment. They lose 113 to 98. Against the Milwaukee Bucks, they've lost a few games in a row here. Darius Garland, what we love to see here is Garland and Mitchell playing together. 23, 4, and 8 for Garland. 23, 2, and 3 with two steals for Mitchell. The assists for Mitchell are going to drop with Garland back. This does not prove it, 
but it's good. It's a good, it's a good piece of evidence, and it's good to see them both scoring well. Mitchell was an obvious sell high when he was the sixth ranked player. He's down to eighth after this. He's twelfth in points. I think he settles in like the twenty five range. I think that's where he ends up settling. So he's still got a little bit of value there to trade away if you want. If not, just roll with it. Evan Mobley, great, awesome. Hadn't done it really all season, but we got it. Twenty and seven. Stealing two blocks, sick. Bad from the line, but everything else was great. Well, they started Lamar Stevens over Kevin Love with um, Jared Allen out. 10 and 5 for Stevens. Four blocks, great. I don't really care that much. I don't think there's much long term stream. Well, I know there's no long term stream value. And let's do it. Let's jack him off. Oh, we're going to do two sounds here. Which one should we do first? Let's jack off. Get that garbage out of here. Dracaris Levert. Dracaris. Two points, 20 minutes. Three assists. You'd be shocked to know he shot 20% from the field. He is the 159th ranked player this season. In points leagues, I'd probably hold in category leagues. What's What are you doing? What's the point? Um, Kevin Love, five and seven in only 20 minutes. The rankings will tell you Kevin Love's a must roster 12 team league guy. I would tell you, I don't know about that. I, I would suggest he probably is, but I'm definitely not as committed to it as what the numbers might tell you. Like, this is the problem to me. He's like a 21, 22 minute a night player who'll have big games. And yeah, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't see it really. It's either been no Garland, no Mitchell, now no Allen. And when they all play, where does he fit? And now Mobley's better as well. Hmm. Okay. I don't know about that one. Well, I do know that Brooke Lopez is dominating. 29 and 5, seven triples, a steal, three blocks. How's this bloke this good? What is going on with this guy? 35 years of age. Hasn't done anything like this for years. He is dominating. And now, yes. There's going to be a fall-off because Drew didn't play, Middleton didn't play, Allen didn't play, Matthews didn't play, Connaughton didn't play. It's five rotation pieces, not including Joe Ingles. So he's not going to do this. And you're not going to be able to get value back enough in a trade. Just enjoy it. Javon Carter continues to have solid value. 11, 4, and 8, 1 steal, 2 blocks. I'd say there's zero chance of this sticking when these players return, but ride it out now. They started Bob Portis. He had 10 and 11. They also started Giannis, who, who is uh, struggling a little bit. Giannis and Tokatomatu. Now, I know it's not realistic or doesn't really give us the idea of what his value is, but for the year in category leagues, he's 49th. 16, 12, and 8, no steals, no blocks. He shot 33 from the field, 36 from the line. I think that his knee is actually more serious. Well, that's two games in a row with bad efficiency. I, I think his knee might be an actual problem, which is not good, is it? Hmm. I'm a little bit worried. Marjan Beauchamp had two points in 27 minutes on 13% shooting. He is not a 12-team league player. And Jordan Wara chimed in with 21 points in 29 minutes. But again, there are five rotation players back. Wara and maybe even Beauchamp probably don't even play when those guys return. That would that would be my expectation for them. The next game, the Houston Rockets beat the Luka doncic Dallas Mavericks. I said this the other day, if, if Luka... Get his hurt on this team at any point, they won't win a game. Like, he's everything. And they just lost to the Rockets at home. And <laughs> that's a pretty good indication that might be true. Cousin Kevin Porter, 17, 11, and 8, one steal, three blocks, including a huge one over Christian Wood. And to be honest, him going three or four from the line is a huge win. He'd been like at 63% over the last two weeks, I think. So going at 75 is a huge win. 43 from the field is not terrible. 67 from three is great. Better game. The delicate dancer, Alperen Shengun. It's a delicate dance in just 17 steps. Only played 26 minutes, but 14 and 7 with 5 blocks. And good percentages. He is 69th in points leagues. He's 51st in category leagues. He's been great. I cannot wait for Silas to start Fernando over him. Um, Eric Gordon didn't do much at all. He's not a 12-team league player. Well, Jalen Green had some struggles, 17, 7, and 6. But what I am interested in here... Rebounds and assists up again. That's the missing piece for him becoming a regular top 40 player. Get some other things going. The steals are not there. Maybe they're never there. But get the efficiency up. Get those other things happening. And they're starting to creep in. Let's let's talk Smitty. Ah, Smitty. All right. There's a couple of things to talk about with Jabari Smith. Part of the reason why I didn't have him at number one in my draft is that I had him at three. It was like... He, he can't create for himself. That was my thing. Like He can't be a, an offensive creator. And it's obviously playing out that way. Like He sort of just sits around and you know, attempts to take threes. 
But he does have a good fantasy skill set, a good rebounder who hits threes, who got steals in college in big numbers, who got blocks in big numbers, and was a decent enough free throw shooter. But we said that he'd probably need to be a punt field goal guy this season. But he's taken that to the extreme. Another horrendous shooting night, 30%. But 10 points, 9 rebounds, 2 threes, 2 blocks, 100% from the line is not that bad. Like, it's not great. And in a points league, I, I get it. His upside isn't as high. Nowhere, nowhere near it. If you want to drop in a points league, I don't think there's any problem with that. In a category league, though, for a guy that we know is going to get 30 minutes a night, and we have to feel confident that he's not going to be a 30% shooter. Even if he's only a 42% shooter, that's 12 extra percentage points. And 12 extra percentage points is like two to three points per game. Confidence boosts. Usage goes up. There's no denying he looks bad. And honestly, if we did a redraft today, as much as I'm loath to change opinions that quickly, there's no way I'm taking him at three. I take Ivy there. Like There's no way I would take him at three if I redrafted today. In fact, I think in some of my drafts, I might have even had, I might have even pushed Ivy to three in some of my earlier mocks and then backed off it. I don't remember that exactly. Um, but there's enough there that just makes me hold on. Am I being a sucker? Probably. But it just makes me hold on enough. KJ Martin had 10 points in two blocks. Uh, he's more he's a 14 team league player to me. He's not really a 12er. While Tari preseason, eight and seven. I think he leads the rookies of the NBA in um in Raptor for impact metrics because his defense has been so good. But realistically, there's just so many guys in front of him for minutes. It's Martin, it's Gordon, it's Smith, it's probably Tate whenever he returns. And Easton's just going to be stuck around 20 minutes and you use him as, as a luxury stash or a steel streamer. We've got big minutes from Christian Wood. 31 minutes, good. That's without Luka Doncic. 26 and eight, really good. He had a usage of 33, took 22 shots, and hit all six of his free throws. You can't complain about anything there. But everything I'm going to say about the Dallas Mavericks, we just have to say Luka Doncic didn't play. Luka's 40% usage didn't play. Luka's assists didn't play. Luka's 40 minutes didn't play. So I don't know what to make out of this. It's great. It's a good bonus. But do I go and like add Tim Hardaway now that he had 28 points with five threes? No. He took 26 shots. We might get half of that next game. We watched Tim Hardaway, but that's about it. Spencer Dinwiddie, he's going to be cursing me that I had him on the uh, Sal High show saying, man, there's no way Spencer Dinwiddie can continue being a 50% shooter from uh, from three. Uh, yeah, that, that's true. He had one of nine in this one. He was also 22% from two, but nine points on 17% shooting. The good thing is he maintained the steal rate, which is like double his career numbers, two steals here with 10 assists. So it's not all bad, but we knew that there was going to be a significant drop-off in his shooting, and it hit, and it hit hard. Joshy Green started. He is a steel streamer, only played 17 minutes, had the two steals there, and there's just not a lot else apart from that Reggie Bullock shouldn't start. It should be just Green. Yeah, Reggie Bullock's terrible. He's he's actually terrible. 33 minutes, missed all six of his shots, zero points, and had three rebounds. Tony Snell, Siri, Siri, I, shut up. Um... Reggie Bullock, shit house. Useful. Newton, useful. Uh, useless. Crap. Dis disgraceful. 12 team leagues, jack him. 14 team leagues, jack him. 16, jack him. What's he doing? Nothing. He shouldn't have this starting spot. And you're going to be stunned to know that after Dorian Finney Smith hit seven triples last game for 21 points, he went seven and eight on 27% shooting, showing that again, you can jack him very, very hard without lube. Get that garbage out! That's a little bit unfair, maybe, but definitely get rid of him. No need to have him on a roster in a 12-team league. Let's go to the last <clears throat> two games of the night. The Warriors lose to the Suns. Yeah. 130-119, the final score. Um, the Warriors are in some real trouble at the moment, and I've got some things to say about them. It's... But yeah, their fans get so like worked up. Like when you have them, I think I had them sixth in the West this season uh, heading in. Look, we're the reigning champions. We deserve to be favorites. I wonder if they're thinking the same thing now because they, um, they look pretty bad at the moment. Steph doesn't. He looks great. 50 points, seven triples, nine rebounds, and six assists. He shot 61% from the field. He took 28 shots. And this is, uh, I'll, I will admit this stuff because like, everything that I do is either written on Twitter or you see videos or, or podcast for it. I Steph, I thought at number six or five, whatever his ADP was, was too high. I had him at like nine. It's not that big of a deal, but I wouldn't have picked Steph at six. Of course, he's maybe looked stupid so far. 
He's the third ranked player. He's seventh in points leagues. All right. It makes me look stupid because I didn't think that everybody else would be dreadful and they would have to rely upon Steph to play huge minutes and have outsized usage and also be finishing at the rim at a career best. Everything that I try and do is based on historical trends and things that make sense and balancing. And I don't think anyone could have gone, you know what? Steph's going to have to go at absolute career best levels, at career best minutes when we thought they've just had a long run. He's old. They're all old. They're going to be able to take it a little bit easy, integrate these guys in. They'll go like this. Um, And that's how I base my decision. No one could have said, yes, Steph will definitely have games at 40 usage in 36 minutes and carry this team and they still lose by double digits. No one said, no one could have said that. Right? So that's why I was off on Steph. But clearly, I've got it wrong. But I will say this. I think he's a sell high. Why? Because there's two things that I think happen here. Either the other players get better and Steph can dial down the insane usage or some of his career best 82% finishing at the rim, which has no chance of sticking, that's going to cool off as well. Or he carries this gigantic load and blows up. Like he just, his body doesn't handle it. Of playing big minutes with gigantic usage of continual attacking at the rim and he, and he, and he gets hurt. Like that, I think they are too. Of the, of the three outcomes of this sticking, the other players getting better or Steph just buckling under a gigantic load at some point, I, I think that the two that don't involve him staying at this level are more likely to happen. And that's how I try to assess all sorts of buy lows and sell highs. What's the most likely course here? And to me, there's two different things which are bad and one which continues that good path. Is this me having some bias based on my prior evaluation of Steph heading to this year of having him ninth or whatever I did? Maybe. But it, it's all still tying in that, well, like, I don't think that these numbers have an ability to continue. And I think Steph is a top 10 player of all time. Honestly, would, yeah, he, he might be higher than that. I love Steph. But I think that's realistic. Now, what he did today was great. 50 points, 9 rebounds, 6 assists, 7 triples. That was by 11. 9 of 9 from the line. These are stupid numbers. Um, Let's talk about the two real problems on this team. Clay Thompson. 29 minutes, but he's getting 30 usage, 30 usage in this game. And I think we have to come to the realization that Clay Thompson is not an efficient shooter anymore. Can he improve from where he is? I think almost undoubtedly. But when you have three years off from playing in the NBA, meaning you're three years older, and those three years off were due to catastrophic leg injuries, you're not going to come back to be the same guy. So while we can sit at this and go, well, look at Clay. He's been this. See you later, Obi. He's been this historically great shooter for so long. So now he's going to have a 55% shooting run to get his numbers back up to career average. I call bullshit on that. I just don't think he's going to get back to those career numbers. I think you've got to look at the career numbers drop him down three or four percentage points, and that's his new baseline is my guess. I don't think his new baseline is being Jabari Smith and shooting 35%, but either there's two things that are going to happen here. The shooting's going to improve a little bit, or he just needs to stop taking so many shots. Like 18 points looks fine, but he is hurting you so much. He is not a top uh, 150 player this season in category leagues or in points leagues. Uh, sorry, points leagues he is. And then Jordan Poole. It is clear as day. We saw it last season. We're seeing it this year. Play him off the bench. He's not good. Start him, he is good. So today, he came off the bench and he had two points in 26 minutes and missed only his five shots. And it's not only the fact that he missed all shots, he had a usage of 11%. 11. The eight assists are solid. Right, That's good. He is still just the 107th ranked player this season. That's before today's game. That'll go down. So it's not a complete disaster. You don't drop Jordan Poole. I, I wouldn't even drop Clay Thompson, although in 10 teamers, I would. I wouldn't drop Jordan Poole, but something's got to give here. Does that mean Looney goes to the bench? Looney's been better than Clay and Poole this season. Just so you can accommodate pool starting? Just pool start over Clay Thompson? I don't think so. And my worry with pool this season, I don't think it'd be this bad. My, my worry that I said on multiple shows was, I, I don't see how he does what he did last season, let alone exceed it when 80% of last season was done without either Steph or Clay. And he had like a top 20 run to end last season when Steph was out. But he hasn't done it with them there and he still hasn't done it with them there. As for Looney... 10 and 8 in 20 minutes, that's okay. He's a solid 14-team league guy and a good 12-team streamer because they are the team with the most quality games over the course of the year. And then Draymond did his thing. 9, 2 and 8, 3 steals. Like That's okay. Draymond's still a hold because he drafted him. You knew he wasn't going to score. And you're getting some of the other, most of the other stuff that you were looking for. Andy Wiggins, yeah, 14, 2 and 1. That's bad, Andrew Wiggins. I still think there's going to be a regression from him from where he started this season. Um, 
the inability to play uh, Moses Moody frustrates me. I think he's really good. But yeah, this team's a mess. Mikael Bridges, 42 minutes. The minutes that he gets are so crazy. 23-9-9. What an amazing performance. He's really stepped up with Chris Paul out. So it might be a little bit of a sell high, but I really like him as a player, obviously. Despite some of my um, issues with his lack of fantasy upside, but with Paul out, he is executing that. And again, I look wrong on that. Devin Booker was great, 27-2-9. But what I wasn't wrong on is saying just go and add campaign and Chris Paul goes down and you just hold him until he comes back. 29-2-7 uh, with six dribbles. He will be up and down, but you're going to get a great option here while, while Paul is out. And Tory Craig's a solid 14-team league guy, 13-10 and 10 with three threes, two steals, and one block. Well, this is one of his best performances. Speaking of best performances, this wasn't DeAndre Ayton's one uh, best performance. Another subpar, putrid... Oh, how aggressive do I want to get? He... Pee harder, do something. Try. Be aggressive. Block a shot for once in your life. Double digit rebounds, maybe. Can you ever take a free throw? I think that while he might be a buy low, that he's not actually going to be a buy low unless, and it's not going to change unless he gets traded. And But they keep winning. There's no reason for them to change it. It's not Monty Williams being a bad coach or anything like that because they keep winning. It's just like he's just like rough. It's just rough with him. That's all it is. Damo Lee hit three triples against his former team in 27 minutes. He's a nice, deeper league three-point streamer. And shockingly enough, Dwayne Washington Jr. wasn't able to replicate his big scoring night. He had five points in 13 minutes. The last game of the night, Thomas Thibodeau got out of it alive. When you just beat the Nuggets, though, by three points, who were without Jokic and Sard and DeAndre Jordan, and it goes down to the wire whether you're going to win, yeah, not, not great. But he won, so I can't argue with it too much, can I? But what I will tell you is that Julius Randle played really well. Now, 42% usage is a lot. And 69% from the line is not a lot. Giggity. And that hurts. But 34 and 11, four assists, four steals. One of his best games in like two years. Really solid stuff. Jalen Bronson has been great. 21, 5 and 7. Efficient shooting. Didn't get any steals, but he's been getting them at big numbers as well. Really good. Cam Reddish played big minutes. He didn't do much. And we I talked a lot about Reddish yesterday saying, I don't really buy this at all. And this is why. 10, 3, and 0. He took five shots. Now, two steals and one block is really good. The minutes are really good. I, I, he's 14-team league to me. He's 16-team league. That's about it. I don't think he's a must-roster 12-team league player because we have seen over the course of this year and last year and last year and the year before and all those years that he'll have these occasional big games, but he can't string it together. And that is not worth having, I don't think, in a 12-team league. Manuel quickly played 28 minutes. Are we getting somewhere with this? I don't know. Only had six points, but five rebounds, six assists, and a steal. He's a watch list guy to me. And um, let's talk about the two bad performances. Isaiah Hardenstein. 22 minutes, zero points, three rebounds, a steal on the block. The steal on the block are good. He got four fouls. But the problem I had, and I said this in the offseason, that I really like Hartenstein as a player. I think he's a better player than Mitchell Robinson. And I still stand by that he is that player. But my problem was is that Tom Thibodeau treats his centers like they are actually basketball illiterate. Please don't ever touch the ball. Don't ever shoot it. I think out of the two low usage players, or well, they had two of the lowest five low usage players last season, Mitchell Robinson, Nolan Noel, because the centers aren't allowed to touch it. And then yeah, maybe I got my mind changed a little bit, but some people say, no, they, they can do that. Like Hartenstein's not Robinson. Hartenstein's not Noel. He can do things. Tibbs, remember, coached Joe Kim Noah. Oh, that's a good point. He did coach Joe Kim Noah. And Hartenstein has a game that's similar to that. Oh, he can shoot it. He can handle it. He can pass. He can distribute. He can set. He can play like the way Jakob Pertl's playing. I won't even say the Jokic comparison. Like he can play like how Pertl's playing at the moment. Or he plays like the cockroach, Mason Plumley. He can do those things. Isaiah Hartenstein had a usage of 2%. I don't even know how that's possible. And that is a Tom Thibodeau problem. And Tom Thibodeau did it last year. He did it the season before. He's doing it this season. Robinson is due back soon. I, I like Isaiah Hartenstein. He seems disengaged with whatever's going on here. And despite all this, even like bef before today's game, he was the 108th ranked player in Category Leagues, Hartenstein. 139th in points leagues. You can jack him in points leagues. No worry. Um, but this is frustrating. Like it's in it's There'll be better games from him. But if you dropped him now, no one will add him, I don't think. I am willing to say, like, you know, me saying add him, that is not the wrong call, right? I will tell you when I'm wrong. Adding him is not wrong. Did it work out? No. But that's not because of a lack of skill from Hartenstein. It's because of the lack of offensive ingenuity from Thomas Thibodeau. 
and not knowing how to use him. But we've got to, that all has to be part of it. And I fucked that up, sorry for the language, by thinking that maybe we get a player who deserves to have the ball and can actually be creative, that maybe we get him to do something rather than like do the same shit every single game for five years, which, which Thibodeau does. Speaking of bad, this is a, a shocking run from RJ Barrett. 11 points, three rebounds, two assists, 22% on 30 usage, 18 attempts, and then he was three or four from the line. You want to know why you hear about why RJ Barrett is a bad category league pick. The last two games should tell you everything you need to know. Low volume threes, low rebounds, low assists, low steals, low blocks, bad field goals, bad free throws. He's not an impactful winning player on the court, and he's a shocking category league fantasy guy. In saying all this, he's still a top 100 fantasy guy for points leagues this season. I wouldn't drop him in category leagues, but... Well, I suppose what I say is if you if you drafted him, you, you knew all of this. You knew this was going to be the case. But he is not a 22% shooter. This, and that means the scoring will go up. And you'll get back to 16, 17, 18. But when guys are playing like quickly, like Brunson, like Randall, who are more efficient and better a lot of the time, maybe he doesn't go back to being that number two usage guy. And therefore, all his value is gone. For the Nuggets... Um, I was just on the phone to Geneva talking about war crimes of starting Jeff Green and DeAndre Jordan together. And they said they're going to come for the Dr. Michael Malone really soon. They've just got a few other things to deal with. But they're, they're onto it. They know about it. What are, you, what, are you, what are you doing? DeAndre Jordan shouldn't be in the NBA. And that's a statement that I said in 2020. Maybe even 19. Let alone starting and playing 26 minutes. Four and eight for Jordan in that time. Zeke Nagy was bad early, but I thought he stepped up late. 13-3 and three in 26 minutes. If Jokic is going to miss next game, which I think he is, a Nagy would be an interesting stream. The headmaster, this is what a recovery from an ACL injury looks like. Kawhi Leonard, Lord Voldemort, you're a year in with three weeks, four weeks into the season. 21-9-6, 33 minutes, 33 is a steal on a block. Unless you had a setback, Kawhi and Voldemort, this is what an ACL recovery is for nearly everybody. But no, everybody, apart from those two. The big stiffy, he played 23 minutes, 21 and 7, five triples. Really on a roll at the moment. Good short-term ad. Whether this is Jokic related, I don't know, but what's happening, add him. KCP had 13 and the Shark had 12 and 6 with a steal and two blocks. That is Bruce Brown for the uninitiated. Baby shark, do, 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 do. But we have to t remember everything here that Gordon was out and Jokic was out of this game. So there's weird rotations, weird minutes. We've got Vlako Chanchar playing nine minutes for God's sake. So that's how you know it's a weird one. Just keep an eye on Naji. He might be the option if um, if Jokic, as expected, misses the next game. All right. I apologize for the length of this show. It's gone a long time. Let's look at the lines of the night. Actually, just one thing. Well, you can see him on the screen. But Jokic and Aaron Gordon, unlikely to play the next game for Denver. That just came through. The monstrous is Steph Curry. Like, of course. The waiver wire is Luke Cornett. Pay no attention to that. The young gun of the night is Kenneth Murphy, the third. Really like what he's doing. And the dud of the night, it's Giannis. It's Giannis and he took a tom or two. Um, the top 10 players in category leagues today, number one was Steph, followed by Brooke Lopez, Trey Murphy, Mikhail Bridges, Anthony Edwards, Carl Anthony Towns, Tyrese Halliburton, Devin Booker, OG Ananobi, and Miles Turner. Your top 10 players rostered in under 50% of leagues. Luke Cornett, don't care about it. Usman Garuba. Be really interesting if they bring Bruno Fernando back. And then don't play Garuba and start him over Shengun. Then I will absolutely rip Silas. Garuba's been really solid as a deeper league player. Tory Craig's a nice 14 team league guy. He was third. Caleb Martin's a streamer for 12s. Hachimura's like a 16 team league player. Um, the Lionheart, Jericho Sims. You just made the list. He's sixth on this list. He's just a defensive streamer until Robinson comes back. Seven is Nembhard, at least a 14 team league guy. Same as Kyle Anderson, who's at eight. Jordan McLaughlin at nine. Nothing to really see there. And Sam Hauser. Um, good three-point streamer for deeper leagues, but obviously benefited from the blowout. Your top 10 players in points leagues today were Steph, Randall, Edwards, Gilgis Alexander, Boll, Kevin Porter, Devin Booker, OG Ananobi, Trey Murphy, and Mikhail Bridges. And that will do it for me today. Don't forget to follow this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and on Odyssey. And if you're on YouTube, hey, please thumb it up. Leave your comments down below. Guys, we are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya.